So sh should I just share Okay, my yeah, screen? Spiros, do you, uh, yeah, do you want to share your screen and say a little bit about the, what your talk was about? Uh, can you enable me to, to do that? I think I cannot do it. Uh, I'm not sure if I can, but someone can. Now you should be able. Yeah, yeah, okay. All right, so um, the idea is, is uh, simple and, and, and very much related to what uh, Eva was just uh, saying. The idea is that you have some uh, uh, interaction in the isocarvature sector, uh, like some potential, and this gets transferred to the carvature sector via some generic coupling, which Eva was calling F, and here I call it G. Um, so, I'm talking about two kinds of PDF. One is close to Gaussian. Uh, the other one is very uh, far from Gaussian. So this is what would give you, for example, uh, you know, uh, very uh, high, high, higher order correlation functions, something like that. And uh, here I wanted to just comment on some uh, complementary methods uh, to, to obtain uh, things that uh, uh, are known in the literature through some you can call it, I guess, semi-classical uh, a method of actually looking at the nonlinear equations of motion. I mean, not linear perturbation theory, but writing down the, the nonlinear equation of motion and try to deduce something about the statistics in a non-perturbative way. So that, that was the main idea. Okay, very nice. Um, yeah, I guess if people have questions, feel free to ask, otherwise I have some questions. Does anyone have an outstanding question? Okay, yeah, maybe I can get it started. I just kind of have sort of a zeroth order kind of dumb question also sort of for Eva, which is that if I have some isocarture sector, I should also expect some smoothing of the power spectrum or things like this. Um, so is it possible that, that I see these effects first in some non-Gaussian correlators as opposed to isocarture in the two-point? function what do you mean um, with uh, about smoothing the, the part well i just i just mean there are various constraints and iso curvature from from the cmb like would i see some non-gaussian stuff before i see iso curvature? Uh, so in i um, mean speaking for our our papers we did analyze that and it, you know there are new effects that can happen in the two-point function for example in this super simple example where it was really Sort of separately Gaussian and Chi and Phi, uh, uh, there could be some sort of subtle uh, differences in the two-point function, but it it wasn't um, overwhelming the the non-Gaussianity. The non-Gaussianity could easily be the dominant effect. So if you, yeah, I I shouldn't go on about that here, but you can find it in the papers if you're interested. Um, I think it all depends on how you eventually reheat and couple to standard model fields since uh, yeah, of course, the yeah. bounds from CMB on uh, isocurvature modes are really about neutrino velocity, photon dark matter velocity or density. And so mm -hmm. I guess if you're agnostic about that, you could, if your model is not going to get in trouble, you could probably always engineer some uh, coupling to standard model fields and such that those effects do not come in before the non gaussianity I, I would imagine it seems reasonable. Well, it, I, I know what you're saying, but here, the, I think what Austin is saying is there's some, there's some interaction that's there, there's some, impl you know, derived from that, there is some contribution to the two-point function. And, you know, say without trying to literally model build that away by canceling it through some later effect, you can ask, does it dominate or not? And I'm saying it, it doesn't. I think so, that yeah, my, my interpretation of smoothing it was uh, about the peaks of the CMB, which are smooth if you have uh, as a curvature initial conditions on on the matter power spectrum, that matter power spectrum, photon power spectrum, and neutrino velocity. So I thought that's what he had in mind. And I'm saying. Yeah, that, that's, that's what I had in mind. But I guess more generically, the question is just whether sort of at higher points, this would be the first place that you would do this stuff. So also whether there is inference in the two point function, stuff like that. Okay. That answers it though, thank you. 
Um, also, there were some questions in the Slack for Spiros. Uh, do you want to bring them up here? I guess Sebastian was raising them. Did you guys resolve everything? Is there anything you want to talk about? Yeah. I think with uh, Sebastian, uh, we will have some uh, discussion. Uh, but I, I think he's, he's right. Uh, he was asking about uh, um, dengue, taking into account the cubic action of uh, a generic to fill the model and how that would change the the transfer of the nonlinear artists from psi to zeta and i, I think he's uh, he's right uh, about his point but but there is a way to to incorporate that and uh, study what corrections to to the non gaussian pdf that would would imply i mean using more or less the same methods that i've shown here yes yes and, I, think, and, I think so so yeah, yeah thanks for the quick uh so, so yeah, that is a bit, that's a bit related to some of the words uh, sorry, that, um, that Eva used, which is uh, intrinsically of psi being um, on Gaussian or not. Uh, there can be intrinsically nonlinear uh, coupling in the transfer. Right? And for example, right. in a different context, yeah. what has been used in, in a very different, but in periodic type uh, models, uh, and this, this, this has been studied. Um, um, that the, the conversion itself can be nonlinear and create non-gaussianities, and in general, have the two. But indeed, with your general methodology, or well, in the end, if, if theta is theta Gaussian plus uh, psi plus psi squared, in the end, you make several and you have the result. So uh, that that should be in principle straightforward to to general. Okay, very nice. Um, can I yeah, uh, do, do I have time or? Yeah, if, if it's quick, but then we should move on because unfortunately yeah, we have a lot of things to answer. I left it on Slack for Eva, but maybe for Spiros also. Do you know if these endpoint functions will leave signal around the squeezed and collapsed limits? That's a very good question. I would say that it, it, it should be squeezed limit the signal, but the, here is when you compute these endpoint functions, we, we compute histogram and point functions, right? So, so there's no scale dependency there. I mean, you count temperatures in the CMB and then you can co compute any endpoint function you want. Now, in order to include scale dependence and probe the shape of these endpoint functions, that is kind of uh, tough uh, to do, but um, I don't know, I, I would expect you know, just because you, you have- can I, can I intervene a little bit? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so in our computation, we uh, focused on the leading contribution, and that and that was fully local, uh, uh, and we neglected any other uh, contribution. So we, we found that they were uh, suppressed. But of course, you can compute them. I mean, uh, it's, it's there to be computed. Uh, but uh, at least what we see is that the, the first contribution is local, fully local. So if I try to correlate uh, two bunches of points at different points, uh, a different uh, just separation in the sky, you think that that would be suppressed? Uh, no, I w we just haven't uh, computed that, but uh, uh, I'm just saying that uh, what we got as the leading uh, contribution was uh, just local concussivity to any uh, order in, in the, mm -hmm. so every correlator was local but uh, uh who knows maybe we neglected something important and uh which is non local and, and we have we just didn't do it there is also uh, the resum yeah. is uh, all the local terms so the least yes yes yeah. that's but we are talking about this uh, picture here uh, this indeed gives local correlation functions to to any order but this uh i'm not sure what it gives uh, so there was one example that we had that I showed that actually was due to Meridot originally, but <laughs> where we, we actually had a field theory calculation and I, I showed it. I, I should actually look back at whether, to what extent it was what, what you would call local shape or not. Um, but so there's one example where the formulas exist um, that I showed and I, I'll just go back and maybe add to Slack the answer for that one. Because I, I just offhand I'm not um, remembering it, but um, so there is one calculable example from from our side that was field theoretic. Otherwise, we did as as Spiros just said the the one point correlator one point uh, PDF um, 
single point correlators and that doesn't tell you right but but there is this one example i don't know if Meridad remembers offhand but uh, maybe one one thing that i can say is that uh, in fact i think one I, comment that i made earlier was is contradicting what i'm gonna say now so the feed redefinition that we we uh, you make the, which is nonlinear. Uh, I think that is the uh, prototype of a uh, local non Gaussianity. I agree. It, it seems to me that most of the the effects that we have discussed are just very involved field redefinition that do not involve derivative. You take a phi and you substitute it times some function of phi and chi, but without derivative. So the naive expectation would be that it's just purely local. Just, but that is, in fact, I don't know if it is a correct way of thinking about it. But suppose that I tell you that zeta is some nonlinear function of phi without derivative. You can already use that to compute all the correlators you want, and the result is going to be a bunch of local. Things. And if there's no derivatives, uh, no, no, sorry, Enrico, but you can, if you have two fields, you can have collapse non Gaussianity, even though the redefinition is local, right? You need multi field, but, uh, but you, but you have uh, uh, this. this okay, guys, I'm, I'm sorry, but otherwise, we're never going to get to yeah. get to everything else. Um, but there'll be plenty of time to, to chat later. Sorry, we have like four other things we're supposed to talk about in 20 minutes. Um, Okay, yeah, so maybe we can go in alphabetical order. Is, is Kurt here? You can talk a little bit about Kurt's talk. Yep, I'm here. Okay, um, yeah, do you just want to maybe summarize briefly what your, your talk was about and then we can ask you questions? Yeah, and, and James and Rachel are here too, I believe, and you're here, we were all on this. Uh, so basically what we did was to generalize the shift symmetries that you find like the Galilean theories, DBI theories, special Galilean theories to De Sitter space. And on De Sitter space, scalars have particular masses where these shift symmetries appear. So there's like a sequence of mass values for a scalar field where you get these types of enhanced shift symmetries. And a similar thing happens for all the higher spins. So we essentially classified these. Great. Um, does anybody have, have questions they want to ask about Kurt stuff? Can I ha ask a general question? Uh, so as I go from flat to ABS and the sitter, uh, is there uh, some kind of uh, uh, connection in the sense that I think in the, in the, the CETA and ABS, you find cases with K less than equal to two in which you get this uh, interest in non abelian extension. Yeah. Uh, and so, and that, I guess that would map to the interesting case of the special Galileans in flat. So, so it seems that there is some sort of continuity is it yeah like, could is, you yeah. a priori predict that this is gonna be the case or you you think of it as an accident yeah i don't think so because you could imagine a case where there's a non an interesting non-abelian interaction in De Sitter, and when you take the limit it becomes abelian something like that you could imagine happening but we didn't find that there does there does seem to be a continuity where where there are where there are non-trivial algebras in the flat case, they also correspond to non-trivial algebras in the ADS case. Okay, I see. So, so your answer is that it is a coincidence? Yeah. As far as I, I know, I, yeah, a priori, I, I think it could have been that there were, there could have been non-trivial examples in ADS which just become trivial in the flat limit. They just put a bunch of Hubble's in the algebra commutators and they exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's surprising that that doesn't happen, yeah. So, can you search for these theories using Bootstrap? 
Yeah, we'd, we want to do something like that because finding the Lagrangians becomes impractical quickly. So what we want is, first we want to know like what, what these symmetries look like from the point of view of the cosmological correlators. If I have a shift symmetry in the sitter space, what does that do for the correlators? And, and can you bootstrap correlators by knowing this? Because in flat space, we know what this is. It's just simple soft limits usually or some kind of soft theorem. Uh, but we're we're trying to figure out what that corresponds to for the de Sitter correlators. Oh, and do you know uh, whether these things play any role in ADS CFD? Maybe we've talked about this before, but. Yeah, I don't, I don't know, because yeah, in, in ADS, they do correspond to normal modes, to they're just some massive scalar modes, but it, uh, there's something with the boundary conditions, like in order to, it's, it's like there are these two possible choices of boundary conditions in ADS corresponding to do two different quantizations, and if you choose the normal quantization of these fields, nothing special seems to happen as far as like the CFT correlators, but if you choose the alternate quantization, then you get interesting things happening in the correlators, like you get logs in position space, which tells you that you, you should be looking at derivatives of fields as the actual degrees of freedom, and which you'd expect if you have a shift-like symmetry that you're, you think should be gauged or something like that. So if that's the case, then this is all happening in the kind of non-unitary regime of ADS-CFD that people aren't usually interested in, whereas in which case these shift symmetries are being broken by the usual boundary conditions that people put on unitary fields in, in ADS. But yeah, so still don't fully understand that. I see. Sorry, but in the case, uh, if we want to talk about gravitational case, I should only think of this as approximate symmetries it's coming yeah. from some decoupling limit of uh, some, some more complicated theory. Is that true? Yeah, I mean, as soon as it depends. Yeah, as soon as if you, if you were to try to couple these to gravity, you would be breaking these shift symmetries by M Planck stuff just like what you do with the Galileans but yeah there should be some you know there's a well-defined parametric sense in which the scale associated with the shift symmetry is different than the Planck scale and you can think of the breaking as weak I know Paulo has worked on this kind of stuff and so do you expect an inconsistency when you try to somehow write down correlators uh, that involve both gravity and is a shift symmetric field uh, that tells you that there is no consistent, I mean, in flat space, you would say the words, there is no consistent way to, to glue two three point functions such that they factorize correctly on a four point function. So yeah, so you should find that whatever the word identity of the shift symmetry is, there isn't a way to preserve it with once you include intermediate gravitons, something like that. Yeah. Because we found something, uh, uh, something similar in, in flat space that certain theories could not be coupled to gravity and the problem was indeed that uh -huh. equations yeah. cannot be satisfied. For example, just a simple phi dot cube interaction that you think in Minkowski is fine, cannot uh -huh. be coupled to gravity. There is no uh -huh. way to attach a graviton to that, that diagram. So you mm -hmm. would like to see the same, but for some the sitter observable. Yeah. I mean, even in flat space, have people done that? Like to look at some Galilean amplitude in flat space and ask if I have an intermediate graviton, does it always spoil the, the soft, the enhanced soft limit? Oh, good question. I actually don't yeah, know. Yeah, it must be. I don't think so, but I'm sure it will. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's where, yeah. In some sense, that's where the back, that's how you can resurrect the existence of the background at the amplitude level or at the observable level. But Right. Yeah. Okay, I see. Yeah, if yeah. you guys know a reference where that has been done, let me know. Okay, yeah, it doesn't, I don't, I don't, I can't think of anything where, that, where that's been done. For the, for the soft limit um, calculations, 
is the fact that you're you're looking at you know equal time correlators rather than s matrix elements so you don't have like an on shell notion to, is that any kind of uh hurdle or does that not really matter uh, yeah i'm not sure that's what we want to figure out because I don't, yeah, Austin, you were saying something about DBI, like if I look at DBI correlators in, as opposed to amplitudes, even in flat space, they don't seem to be soft. Yeah, yeah, at least that's what seems to be, seems to be the case. Um, and I don't know, there's also weird stuff about contact terms. It's not clear they have to be literally zero. They can be zero of the contact term. So I think, I think there are some technical, technical subtleties for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, but okay, yeah, I guess we have a whole grab bag of things to things to talk about. So if there are no other questions for Kurt, uh, maybe we can move on if I'll we'll stop and see if there are questions. Okay, uh, good. So um, maybe we can talk a little bit about Leonardo's talk if Leonardo is here. I guess Paolo is also here. Hi, Mia. Uh, yes. Um, hey, hey, Leonardo. Hi, guys. Um, yeah. yeah, maybe you want to just take a few seconds to sort of summarize your talk, just remind people what you said, and then we can... Yeah, if you, if want you want to share a share screen, mm -hmm. I'll make you host. I, mean, I can show a picture if you want. Um, now you should be able to share. Okay, so basically, um, so... Um, this is a talk uh, which uh, has almost nothing to do with the content of the conference, <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, because uh, it is about how it doesn't compute any correlator, but it tells uh, it's about uh, how to get to the city space. So at least it's a bit motivational. And uh, well, in the last few years, we, we realized that uh, it is possible to, with some colleagues, we, we, we realized that it's possible to explore uh, the evolution of the universes that start completely homogeneous and that have a saying in Flesch and Lagrangian, but the initial conditions are not the ones that we normally associate with inflation, it's not homogeneous. And uh, it's possible to study using some mathematical techniques called mink water flow. And um, we made some progress, uh, and in particular, um, we were able. So this is a highly debated uh, historically since the beginning of inflation because the question is how likely is uh, for, for inflation to start uh, if you start from uh, inhomogeneous initial conditions. Because uh, uh, naively, uh, inhomogeneous patches uh, recollapse, so later they become sort of denser. And so if you start with a manifold which is completely homogeneous, almost everywhere you expect, at least or everywhere you expect that you have a black hole. This was the normal expectation. And then in the last few years, we realized that because of topological reasons, actually this, this cannot happen globally. The universe cannot crunch globally. And we were able to show that, for example, uh, uh, we were able to show properties of the evolution. And in the result I presented, which is also with Paolo, and with two mathematicians, we were able to show that uh, if you take uh, a three-dimensional a three plus one a three dimensional cosmology, three, 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 three dimensions plus time, so normal visual cosmology, with the particular properties that uh, uh, the, the, there are two translational symmetries, like this circle here represents two dimensions which are homogeneous, and then there is a, a further action which is uh, inhomogeneous. So we, we decided that, that to study this particular symmetric configuration, which is basically there is Roughly speaking, there are two translational symmetries and one non-invariant non, non, non direction, which is there's no symmetry. And imagine that there is an initial condition like this and let the universe go. This is the full universe. So this is the full universe where we compactify, we identify this direction, this circle with this circle. This could be a sphere or a tutorus or some, several topologies of this two-dimensional manifold. We, we identify this direction, so we have a compact mani special manifold and we let it go. And we're able to prove very rigorously, like, uh, I don't know, like this field of mathematical physics, like, uh, I don't know, like Volt, for example, the typical guy, uh, that uh, the universe, uh, a universe that started like this uh, asymptotically uh, reaches, uh, uh, becomes everywhere in this thing, physically indistinguishable from the city space. So at least with these configurations, there is no problem with uh, starting inflation because inflation, in a sense, will start. 
And uh, I think that's good for us that study correlations in the city space. So that's maybe a refreshing. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe I'll abuse my power to ask the first question. So um, I guess everything you're showing is strictly for a, like a cosmological constant in the background. But if I imagine instead there's some inflaton whose energy is diluting with time. So I think all the things you show are sort of like asymptotic future statements about the convergence of metrics. Like, should I be worried that the inflaton is going to dilute over time and kind of mess things up? Because I don't think you have bounds on like how long it takes to get to the sitter, right? So is that uh, something to uh, yeah, that, about? yeah, that's super correct. So super correct. In fact, uh, I mean, uh, uh, I should say, yeah, there are two ways to answer your question. First of all, is that this, this, uh, this. Uh, so first of all, we, mathematically, we have a notice that uh, I would like to stress that these are. It's pretty strange that we're able to say something on completely nonlinear system. So we can say something. We cannot say anything. Everything, yes. So, but the time scale to, of convergence to the sitter is about the, the cosmological constant. So it doesn't take so long, actually, okay? It doesn't take so long because everything, we find that everything decays pretty fast and that the slowest uh, test time scale is what dictates the, 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 the convergence, which is the, the cosmological constant, which is exponential in that, in that. So actually, I don't think one should be worried because of that thing. Mm -hmm. But uh, also, I mean, as I said in the talk, this is started from some experimental, these, all these research lines started from experimental work where we ran the numerical simulations where we, we didn't have a cosmological constant. We really have a, an input on there. By the way, when you say the cosmological constant, we should say that there is a normal matter plus a cosmological constant, full of, full, full of over densities. And even the inflaton, there are two kinds of things that might worry us. One is the the gradients, but they, they rush it very quickly. And the other is the fact that it, indeed it might roll down, down the potential and maybe reach the bottom of the potential. That maybe is the worry. And we ran this numerical simulation like this one, and uh, basically inflation always starts. We couldn't make it. I mean, if you start with the inflation on top of the potential, but inhomogeneous, inflation always starts. So, and you can make an argument why it's, it, everything is pretty free, quick, so I wouldn't be worried about that. Of course, if you make an inflaton potential too steep, yes, then of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. Mm -hmm. Okay, other questions for Leonardo? I have a question. Uh, it's about um, how, you, how you define physically indistinguishable from the sitter. I wanted to understand it better. So basically, we have a function of time, h of t. So one thing that you can say is that this function becomes constant. And another thing that you can say is about its derivative. For example, h dot over h square, or h double dot over h dot h. Uh, so of course, all this, this lower all parameters. Mm. And uh, so when you actually go through the derivation, what mathematical condition do you, do, do you impose to be physically indistinguishable from the sitter? Is just the, the function or all of its derivatives? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, very good. Good point. Yeah, so notice that uh, here we don't have just function of time, but also function of space. So uh, the gradients are can be very complicated. Now, what we mean uh, is that, uh, yeah, we don't have, what we find is that uh, initially there is convergence uh, um, to the city space, uh, but uh, in a sort of smoothed sense. And uh, to make this, uh, uh, that is, uh, there could be little spikes here and there. And to, and to, to understand this, uh, which are little inhomogeneities that are remnant. And to, to, to get rid of those, uh, to understand the, if they are physically relevant or not, we, we can show that actually the, the, the length of any curve, in particular, any future, future oriented uh, time like curve, uh, that is in particular any geodesic, take any geodesic between two points, this length. Uh, is this energy path is the same as it converges to be the same as in the city space. Okay, so any, any particle will move, uh, as it moves in geodesic, will move like in the city space. And uh, based on this, uh, then you can make another step, uh, which is you, then you can, this proves that there is an horizon. And therefore, and then one can, uh, we can show that uh, the matter, the, what I told you is about the metric. What about if there is other matter around, like another scalar field interacting with you? Is this going to be look like in the city space? And we can show that uh, any component uh, of the stress sensor of this additional matter is uh, less than any, any threshold you converges to zero, converges to stereotype. That is, any, the, the, 
any uh, this the integral the, the amount of, the integral of the stress tensor that on the over the ridge that can be accessed by an observer from some time on if you take late enough times is smaller than any threshold that is it really becomes empty space this is a, this is what we mean by empty space there is an amount of matter that is small if you wait long enough it is smaller than any threshold I understand. So can I ask you to say a very simple example, which is much simpler than what you studied because it's homogeneous. Just take a cosmological constant plus pressureless matter. I can compute epsilon, h dot over h square, and it's like one over a cube. And so eta, h double dot over h, h dot, is going to be minus three. And it's mm -hmm. just minus three forever. In what sense? Uh, yes, hey, if you add a little bit of the no, sorry, yeah. a little bit of pressure, so the cosmological constant plus pressureless matter, and then h dot only picks up the pressureless matter because the cosmological constant is constant. So h dot over h equals to zero. H double dot over h equals to zero. H dot over h square is one over a cube. That's yes, equals to zero. H h. Uh, H goes to a constant. Yeah, so H, H dot over H to any part, I mean, H and derivative of H over H to the N goes to zero. Well, but eta, the slow roll parameter eta is minus three fixed because it's H double dot over H dot H. Uh, and, uh, and eta would appear, for example, in the equation of motion for zeta. So I was wondering to what extent that's something that you would call physically distinguishable or not so are you sure that it's i mean okay we, we uh, can, we can. I, I can do the we should do the calculation i find it surprising that eta i was also very surprised but in our universe with that uh, matter i think the asymptotic future of eta is minus three i, I can yes but this shouldn't be playing physical okay Okay, I can follow the algebra, but come on. I mean, there is no dark matter around at some point. How can it be this true? Okay, I can check more, but I find it a bit strange. About the function versus its derivative. So the function no, becomes, back. but it, it does it very fast. Okay, I mean, um, okay, yeah. modulo checking is zeta, and then this doesn't happen. But this, by the way, this is the, uh, yeah, this is the, what we're talking about is the, the famous theorem by Bob Ward in the, in the homogeneous case, which yeah, is yeah, uh, and I believe that you guys probably that. I was just trying to understand what is the mathematical condition. Yeah, the mathematical condition. Yeah, is that um, the geodesic distance is the one that you. By the way, see. in Ward, he really proves that the Ricci. So in, in the case, even with the matter. So I think your statement needs to be checked because it shows that the Ricci. Yeah, we but, don't care of eta, but because the problem is that I don't think we care too much of eta, but uh, yeah, the Riemann, the Riemann goes to. Exactly. If you only couple to Riemann, but if you are zeta, like the curvature perturbations, you are not a spectator field, so you don't only see Riemann. So I think in your equation of motion, you can have eta. In the, in the spectrum of I need to think about this. I need to think about it. I mean, uh, zeta, of course, uh, is, is something that doesn't exist in the city space. So, and uh, maybe it's particularly sensitive. I am be surprised. I am be surprised. I'll yeah, it's it. confusing. So maybe we can discuss more and to see mm. how it's resolved. But yeah. uh, I think for physicists, uh, I mean, okay, maybe a week is not happy if there is a particle of dark matter in the universe uh, still going around. Okay, that's okay. It's okay. But I think for physicists, if the universe is empty and there is a cosmological, I mean, frankly, because here we're doing this with uh, mathematicians also. With, but uh, we're talking about the universe that becomes empty. There is uh, one particle in uh, as much uh, of dark matter as, uh, in, in as much space as you want. And uh, on average, all quantities goes like this, uh, like the metric is the same as the city space. So I think uh, most at the physics, I'll, I mean, this is a provides incredibly strong indication that, uh, that the university is the city space. Now, the mathematical proof stops at some level, but uh, um, Okay. Yeah. But, uh, Let yeah, me. Can I ask a yeah, Can yeah, I ask a quick uh, okay. quick question? No. no, no I, I think can't. we. 
All right. No, we're already kind of over time. I, uh, well, I guess I'll, I mean, I'll ask you're on. ultimately the keeper of the schedule, so I'll kind of leave it up to you. But uh, I no, think we're supposed okay. to do you're something the, in 10 minutes. So. Yeah, you're the chair, so please carry yeah, on. Yeah, so maybe we can just uh, briefly discuss uh, CE's talk. Um, yeah, and we have more discussion at the end of the day again. So I think the most interesting things can just come back later on in the day. Yeah, 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 of course. Um, yeah, so is, uh, is CE here? Hi. Um, you're muted right now. Oh, okay. Anyway. Um, yeah, do you just want to uh, briefly summarize your talk and then we can uh, discuss a bit? Okay, I just, uh, uh, we just studied how the uh, rigid trajectory of uh, classical strings uh, is modified on the series phase. And, and we studied several uh, yeah, and the, the, the rigid trajectory in the third space has a maximum spin and the maximum mass, which is different from a flat space uh, rigid trajectory. And we discussed several cosmological implications about this, and also we studied several classes of uh, uh, classic string. Uh, solutions in the third space uh, like spiky strings or um, uh, strings uh, with uh, internal uh, space dimension. Mm. Uh, okay, great. Yeah, um, so I, there was some discussion in Slack about the bound on the inflationary energy scale? Do people want to uh, talk about it? Okay. Uh, I think the question is, uh, yeah, the, the question is that uh, there, there exists a light string, light long string. And I, I agree that there exist uh, the light long strings, uh, but my, my point is that um, we require a UV completion. That means that we have in mind the, the, um, uh, the infinite higher spin towers that, and the, the, the largest string, uh, the, the la largest uh, mass will be heavier than the, uh, Planck scale, that is the requirement from UV completion. Uh, we are not saying that uh, it's, it, we are not saying that it's impossible to have uh, long light strings. Uh, does, that, does that address the question? So if the requirement is that you have a Reggie trajectory all the way up to Planck mass strings, is that right? Yes. Yeah, I don't understand why is that a requirement? Uh, yeah, this requirement com uh, comes from the UV completion yeah, with, because we want infinite uh, uh, spins and mass to have the UV completion. So is it, is it not possible that like the string S matrix could get softened at some scale intermediate between the string scale and the Planck scale? Or it, the assumption really is that it happens at the Planck scale? I mean, normally it is the string scale, right? The amplitudes uh, soften exponentially in various ways uh, at the string scale. And of course, how long a string is depends on who's asking, like what resolution you have. Um, as Lenny showed years ago, and we confirmed laboriously in the S matrix, um, you know, the variance of the size of the string grows in the longitudinal direction linearly with energy um, in the transverse direction logarithmically with energy. So when you guys talk about a long string, you have to ask who, who's, who's measuring it. <laughs> Yeah, I guess my my main question is that is should there be an I just don't get the intuition behind 
this requirement that the string, which is the horizon size, has to have a mass which is at least M Planck. Why couldn't it be lighter than M Planck? I, because that's, that, that's how the scale of inflation uh, or the constraint on the scale of in, inflation and uh, is derived in uh, C's talk. Uh, so I just, it's, this seems to be the key point. Sorry, I'm really sorry. Could you summarize the argument? Um, so I, I just share the screen. Uh, yeah, yes. Uh, we, yeah, we, we discussed this. Um, so this purple line is a rigid trajectory and in this first place, uh, there exists a maximum uh, thing and uh, Mm, sorry, I didn't go down. And uh, the argument is that uh, uh, in order to um, we complete, then then don't we expect that the uh, the the mass of the uh, heaviest uh, string uh, has to be bigger than the uh, the the Planck scale. Uh, maybe, maybe can I add a comment? So it, it's the um, uh, heaviest uh, string scale is below Planck scale. We have highest mean states only below Planck scale. So if we want to have higher spin states uh, up to Planck scale, we have to require this. And this is just one assumption, but uh, the intuition that in order to make mild scattering amplitude up to Planck scale, then we should have higher spin states or up to Planck scale. This is the idea. Sorry, uh, can you just connect this to the fact that, um, you know, S matrix amplitudes in string theory soften as a function of, you know, S, T, and U mm -hmm. in a way that is dictated by alpha prime, the string scale. Um, you know, let's say classically first, uh, meaning tree level. Ah, uh, yeah, so, so in tree, okay, so, so, so in flat space, uh, let's see, uh, in flat space, if you, if you have higher speed states up to some high, high energy scale, we can make mild your scattering amplitude up to this scale. And if you don't have any more higher speed states, uh, there is no suppression of high energy scattering. High energy scattering I see. So, so yeah, in the case of flat space, we have infinitely many higher speed states. So if you consider three level scattering, uh, we can make mild up to arbitrary scale. But in the case of Toshita space, we have maximal spin in each rich trajectory. So if we assume that this rich trajectory has sufficiently many higher spin states, then it implies some bound. Well, I, okay. I mean, uh, you know, it's so, true that as, uh, as, 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 as the string states get heavier, they get, they get more dilute. This depends on dimensionality. You know, there's this whole story of the um, in terms of what, whether the Planck scale ever enters, this, this sort of has to do with the correspondence limit. So as you, as you take strings heavier mm -hmm. and heavier, they, depending on dimensionality, they either dilute so much that they never reach a Planck density. Um, mm -hmm. Or, you know, and in late time to sitter, there's plenty of room to dilute. Or, or, or they, um, or they um, get so dense at the string cup that you know there's a, there's um, enough string there that uh, that the even if the string coupling is nominally weak, then still the thing will collapse into a black hole, and then you transition to black holes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the, the transition will appear around the Planck scale, and we are trying to require that amplitude it becomes milder before before this Planck scale. 
Yeah, so, so in order to make a conclusive result uh, statement, uh, we have to check scattering in Toshita space and which is beyond our scope in this project. And so far we have just uh, identified spectrum of the strings, uh, string spectra. So yeah, our, our prospect is that if we can generate, uh, for example, in the case of ADHD, we know how to compute four point um, uh, three point temperature, a uh, three point function or a four point function by using integrability. So if we can generate such idea to do the space uh, string scattering, then maybe we can answer this question. So this is just our first step towards such a direction. The idea is to utilize uh, progress in integrability in ADHD to do the space. And what we found so far is that uh, the spectrum of uh, the ridge trajectory is completely different from flat space and ADS. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, so we are not taking this uh, bound on inflation scale so seriously. And this is just an illustration of what kind of thing we can say if we clarify property of string scattering into star space in, fu in the in future. So we are trying to advertise integrability community to work on the star space string theory together. So this is the main purpose of this talk, I think. Can I just make one more okay. brief comment, which is just like for a black hole, there's a there's a kind of near, flat region near the horizon, um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> like a you know a. Um, like uh, del delta x plus delta x minus is some constant um, that region. Mm -hmm. If that if that uh, you know delta x plus delta x minus is some uh, let's call it r squared. If that r is less than r Schwarzschild or r Sitter, then it's approximately flat space. And often the scattering is contained in that region, especially at high energies. So um, mm -hmm. it, it it's actually possible sometimes in that con in that situation to. Um, to generalize flat space results to to oh. these curved backgrounds. Um, this this came up before in the black hole version of, of your question. Mm -hmm. But yeah, this, oh, sounds yeah. Very, this sounds very interesting. I'm sorry, I feel like I derailed Meridad's question, but so maybe we should go back to whatever that was. No, um, it, I think it was on the subject. I, 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 I I still need yeah I mean I guess I need to understand better how uh, how to interpret this observation about the red trajectory in this city. Yeah, so I think we are in fact a little bit over time, so this is probably a good place to. Uh, and the discussion for now. And I think we have another longer discussion coming up like three minutes ago. So we'll be plenty more time to discuss these things. All right. So thanks everybody for the talks. Um, thanks Eva for the long talk and thanks for the discussions. And I guess we'll